far. So, the uh, following program is brought to you by Haymarket Books. And uh, at a time like this, radical ideas are obviously needed more than ever. And um, Haymarket, uh, as well as producing uh, these virtual events, brings out books by Arundhati Roy, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, uh, and many other wonderful writers. And uh, if you're moved by any of the program that you're about to see, you can support the work of Haymarket by uh, buying their books from their own website. And even better, you can join the Haymarket Book Club. All right, so hi everyone. Um, welcome to Agents for Abolition. My name is Tamara Napper and I uh, am the co-organizer of this event along with Sean Larson um, and some of the Haymarket staff who uh, do event planning. And I'm gonna be moderating today's conversation. So um, before uh, we get into the conversation, we're gonna kind of take care of a couple items. We have with us a great panel of people, people who have a long history of doing some of this organizing work, as well as writing and journalism um, regarding uh, prison abolition and also uh, um, immigration enforcement abolition. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about their bios because they're so brilliant and so accomplished that it would take up too much time of the panel, but that information is available on the Eventbrite, so please check it out if you have uh, more details you'd like. So joining us today is Mia Mingus, Harsha Walia, Victoria Law, Anouk Prasad, and Sarat Soon. And um, before we get into the conversation, I just wanna kind of uh, say a few items about Haymarket. It is important that we support independent publishers and organizations during this time. Um, and so you can do this in a couple of ways. First, buying books from Haymarket, our sponsor, and joining the Haymarket Book Club. 
And second, by making a donation to Survived and Punished. And so one of the things that I really appreciate about all the panelists is that um, all of us are volunteering our time to be part of this conversation. And I had asked everybody if they were okay with um, having donations be made uh, to Survived and Punished. And all of them were very gracious and said, of course, right? So Survived and Punished is a volunteer-based organization. Um, they have different city chapters, but they're also national. And they work with uh, defending and helping support criminalized survivors and trying to get them released from state custody or prison. And later on, um, Anoop is gonna tell us a little bit more about them because he works with them closely. And so we'll be incorporating more about Survive and Punish through that. Um, and so thank you to everybody who donated Survive and Punish. From what I heard, we got a decent amount of donations that we'll be able to give to Survive and Punish through Haymarket. Now, just to let you know, this video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Thank you also for those of you who are tuning in. You might not have registered, but you might be tuning in through that channel, so thank you. Um, you can subscribe to the channel and you can like this video right now, right, or later, and you can share it with many people, as many people as possible. Now, a couple things. Um, there are two upcoming events in the Haymarket live stream series. On Thursday, uh, Giannis Varifakis and Daniel Denver, which will be at 12 p.m. Eastern, and on August 20th will be decarceration from the US to Palestine at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and you can find out more of that information um, from the Haymarket website or from Haymarket's Twitter or Facebook. Um, so now a couple other items. For folks who wanna follow the chat, we suggest you use the top chat option rather than live chat, okay? So the top chat option. Um, if you violate our community guidelines, your comments will be deleted, deleted as quickly as possible, right? We're trying to avoid, you know, some of the, uh, you know, foulness that's been going on in some of these webinars. So, um, and so with so many people joining this call, we were very lucky from what I heard, we had at least last night, 800 people registered and we probably have some even more so since then. So thank you for registering. But uh, we may need your patience if we have any technical issues, if the stream gets choppy, if you're reduced image quality. So please be patient, all right? Know that we're working on it. Um, and folks will give you some instructions on how to do that in the chat, so pay attention to the chat, okay? And uh, we will have live, clo live closed captions, excuse me. Um, so to enable captions, please click the CC button on the bottom of the video. And if you're having any trouble with the closed captions, there will be a link in the chat to the raw caption feed, okay? And I wanna thank Nicole for white, with White Coat Captioning. Um, so thank you, Nicole, with White Coat Captioning for doing the live captioning tonight. We hope to have some time for the Q&A at the end, but I have to warn you, the conversation might get so juicy that we might just be kind of so up, you know, in the conversation. So, but we will try our best to try to get a few uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, so I just wanna uh, basically kind of talk a little bit very briefly about the format. This is, as the panelists know, not kind of a panel where each panelist presents. Um, we are gonna have kind of a starting question that uh, is gonna be for everyone, but it's really gonna be about kind of uh, touching upon different themes of people's work and experience. So that way they can amplify some of their kind of paths towards abolitionist politics and some of their abolitionist experiments in their work, right? Um, and we're also gonna have a conversation with each other. So uh, that's kind of uh, how it's gonna be uh, going. So the first question, thank you for all that, everybody. Um, so, uh, and then finally, I just wanna thank Haymarket and I do wanna thank Sean Larson for all the work that we've done directly. And then anybody else who is helping with this event planning behind the scenes or right now, Thank you so much for your work on this, okay? And thank you to everyone who's tuning in. All right, y'all are like, this sounds like, you know, the Oscars, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's get started, okay? So I wanna start out with asking you guys, like, when did you start to think critically about the police or about prisons, right, in your life? What was something or an experience or, you know, that kind of brought that up? How about we start with Harsha, since you're nodding your head. See, this is what I do when, in the classroom. If you make eye contact with me, or if you just start nodding your head, I call on you, right? Everyone's gonna be like, <laughs> so, Harsha, why don't we start with you? All right, stoic face from now on. <laughs> I don't blame <laughs> um, 
Thank you all. It's it's such an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I do want to start just by acknowledging I'm on Coast Salish territories. I'm on the lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squahomish people. And so those are the Indigenous territories that I'm on today. Um, and I say that, you know, not just as an acknowledgement or recognition, but particularly in the context of abolition, recognizing settler colonialism on the lands that I'm on and elsewhere is very much intertwined with uh, abolition and particularly that state formation through reserves or reservations are very much carceral kind of formations of, of containment of indigenous peoples and nations. Um, I also want to acknowledge Black August. We're in, in the midst of Black August. Um, and this also goes to your, your question, um, particularly to remember and salute George Jackson, who was murdered in 1971 in a prison rebellion. Um, and some of my, my first um, kind of interactions and learnings around prison abolition uh, were definitely through Soledad Brothers um, mm -hmm. and George Jackson's writings. Um, and I know tomorrow that you've certainly been lifting up the legacy um, of the Soledad Brothers and making sure that we don't forget um, their, uh, their contributions to prison abolition and those who are incarcerated on, on the inside. Um, it's also here because I'm located in so-called Canada, I will just let people know that yesterday in the Canadian context is uh, Prison Justice Day, and that's to commemorate uh, the death of a prisoner, Eddie Nolan, uh, in, uh, who's a lifer in SEG here in Canada, in Ontario, and he bled to death uh, in 1974. And so for three plus decades, Prison Justice Day has been commemorated here on these lands. And um, this comes, I'm, I'm coming, these are all, you know, part of my political formation in terms of um, my understanding. Uh, and 10 years ago to this very day was the arrival of the MV Sun Sea. The MV Sun Sea was a boat uh, carrying, bringing 492 Tamil refugees to the West Coast. This boat spent three months um, at sea. Um, at least one person died uh, during that passage, during that migration. Uh, and every single one of those 492 people uh, was incarcerated and detained by the Canadian state here on the West Coast. Uh, detained in many instances for years, years and years on end. Um, and every week we used to have noise demonstrations and noise rallies uh, and prisoner support rallies uh, for months and months every Sunday in front of the Family and Youth Detention Center. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, one thing that always stood out to me is, is during those weekly rallies, uh, one of the things that would happen as part of that in very stark contrast uh, to the Canadian state's uh, violence and incarceration was indigenous communities and indigenous nations uh, would come and enact ceremony and welcoming uh, for those incarcerated Tamil refugees. And so, you know, these are just some of the political moments uh, and understandings uh, for me around abolition, both of prisons and police and really all kind of carceral formations um, and really kind of crystallized in the kind of post 9-11 context where we saw, um, you know, a rising movement around migrant justice. And so one of the movements that I was part of was No One Is Illegal, which very firmly stood against all detention and deportation. Um, and this, you know, was again, in contrast to many migrant justice movements that really took the position of kind of good immigrants, bad immigrants, deserving immigrants, uh, you know, desirables, non-desirables, et cetera. Um, and our political orientation was very much against all detention and all deportation to affirm no one is illegal. And really what flowed and stemmed from that was an understanding that if illegalization is a process, right, that no human being is illegal, there's no undesirable, then that is essentially a very similar, it's not you know, identical, but it's very similar to the process of criminalization, that no human being is a criminal, um, mm -hmm. that prisons and police are similarly kind of social contracts, uh, social kind of constructs of containment. And so um, that really was the context for me. Thank you, Harsha. And we're gonna loop back to some of the things you talked about when we get more into some of the work that Sarat and Anoop are doing um, regarding uh, deportation work and so forth, since I see a lot of connections and things that can uh, come from that. So Victoria. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why don't you share your story? Okay, so thank you, Harsha, for reminding us that it, 
is Black August uh, because I actually don't ever remember what month I am in. I actually thought that September 2020 was last year. So I, I am now in a weird time loop. So thank you for reminding all of us who are also in similar weird time loops about this. Um, I, and I wanted to bring up before I forget, since we are in August, one of the first instances that I learned about prison resistance and particularly women's prison resistance that not many people had heard of is the 1974 August rebellion that happened about two hours away from where I'm sitting in New York City at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison for women, where uh, in July of 1974, a black incarcerated woman named Carol Crooks filed a lawsuit against the Department of Corrections that challenged their practice of throwing women into solitary confinement without giving them a hearing. In August, the court sided with her and said, and issued an injunction that said, prison, you cannot throw people in solitary confinement without a hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, in response, six male officers uh, assaulted Carol Crooks dragged her out of the housing unit, threw her in solitary confinement without a hearing. And that might've just been the end of it, except the women around her said, you know what, enough is enough is enough, and rose up and took over portions of the prison, barricaded themselves in, took several guards hostage. And it wasn't until male guards from neighboring male prisons and male state troopers were called in that they were able to you know, uh, put down the uprising. And I bring this up because it was one of the things that kind of drew me to looking at instances of organizing and resistance in women's prisons that we often don't see or we overlook or that history ignores. Even though this happened in 1974, three years after the Attica Rebellion, uh, when prisoners' rights and incarcerated people's organizing was at the was at the forefront of people's minds and there were connections between different liberation movements outside and inside. So I want to bring that up before I forget in our wonderful conversation and swirls of other topics. So Harsha brought up Black August and I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the August rebellion happened mm -hmm. also on this month. So this is the anniversary month. So I actually uh, started thinking critically about police and prisons through personal experience. I grew up in Queens, one of the five boroughs of New York. Uh, I went to a high school that we would now call a school to prison pipeline high school. We didn't have any such terminology back then. Uh, yes, I, I am dating myself, I am old. Uh, so it was a school back when New York City had zoned schools. So where you lived determined where you would go to school. Uh, and if you were wealthier or more resourced, or just had friends that would let you borrow their address in a better neighborhood, you could lie about your address and send your child to a different high school. My mom did not have that kind of social capital. She did not have friends uh, who would let her borrow their address. She also didn't know that this was a thing. She was like, oh, of course she's gonna go to that high school two blocks away or four blocks away, sorry. But no, the cutoff line was two blocks away. And so I was going to a different high school because she didn't know how the system worked. And so what ended up happening is I went to a school that was mostly black, brown, and immigrant. Uh, from Students were mostly from families that didn't have social capital, like myself. The, you had to go through a metal detector every morning. You had to put your bag through like an airport scanning type of x-ray machine. Uh, there were security guards that were like police officers and often treated people as if they were somehow criminals in need of punishment and control. Um, there were often fights in the hallways. Uh, there were teachers that cared, but when you have 40 students in your classroom, you can't necessarily like pay attention to what all 40 students are doing every single second of the day. And they're all shuffling in and out. So, you know, from periods one to nine, you know, you've got 40 different students. Uh, math people can do the math as to how many students that means each teacher saw. Um, and it was the perfect recruiting ground for gangs. And so my introduction to critical thinking about policing in prisons also was sort of my introduction to like, you know, sort of like, you know, like larger Asian organized groups, which came in the form of Chinatown gangs. Uh, so now if we all think about what we were like when we were 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, maybe 19, um, and you are looking at sitting in a classroom all day, every day uh, with teachers that may or may not care, but don't have the resources to help you, 
Uh, I'm thinking that maybe you're going to like graduate and go to community college, or maybe you're going to graduate and go get a job at the sea town, you know, slicing deli meat. And then somebody comes along and says to you, how would you like to make a couple of hundred dollars every single night? Many of my friends thought, hmm, this is a good idea. Uh, and so they joined gangs, they dropped out of school, and then one by one and two by two, they got arrested for gang-related activities, armed robbery, assault, gun things, uh, all sorts of other gang-related activities. And so I started going to visit them at Rikers Island. Now, for viewers that don't really know New York City, we have these like terrible schools, and then we have an entire island devoted to pretrial detention. If you ever fly into LaGuardia Airport, you can look and you can see this Rikers Island right next to the airport. Um, so at the time, I think there were 10,000 maybe people detained on Rikers Island and 85 to 90% were there pre-trial because their families could not afford bail, uh, which is the amount of money that you pay so that you can get out of jail while awaiting trial. And so for people who have never visited a jail or never visited Rikers, maybe other jails are faster, um, you would go, you would take this bus across the bridge to the island, and then you would sit in a waiting room and wait to get processed. Uh, and then they would board, make you go board another bus depending on which housing unit your person was in. And you would board a school bus and you would go to another housing unit. And they would make you put all your stuff in a locker. And remember this is the days before cell phones, but also you would have had to put your cell phone in the locker or couldn't bring it on the island anyway. Uh, for people who wanted to read or do something else, you had to put everything in the locker. There is no reading a magazine or like reading a book. So you just sat there and you sat in a waiting room until they called your number. And then they made you go up and then they searched you and then they made you go upstairs and then you sat there. And sometimes you would sit there for three hours, for four hours, for mm -hmm. five hours. I think the most I ever waited was six hours. Anyhow, and you had nothing to do. There's like, it's not like the dentist's waiting room or something where there's a TV that shows you things you don't want to look at. You know, like there's absolutely nothing to do. So what I did is I just started talking to people around me, which is what everybody did in the waiting room because we are bored out of our skulls. And every person I talked to would be like, oh, who are you here to see? Oh, you're here to see your friend. Oh, you're here to see, you know, oh, I'm here to see my boyfriend or my father or my brother or my son or my husband. And every single person talked about what their loved one was accused of. And it was all crimes that pointed to lack of opportunity, you know, or lack of treatment. So like my man is here for drugs. My brother is here for theft. You know, this one is here because he violated his parole. This one is here because he violated his probation. Nobody was there because they were Jeffrey Dahmer. Nobody was there because they were Bernie Madoff. You know, it was all black, brown, immigrant people who didn't have opportunities or resources. And at the same time, because my friends were not really around for me to hang out with because they were all at Rikers, uh, I started coming into the city and noodling around bookstores. So, you know, when we talk about independent bookstores, thank God for independent bookstores, because Amazon does not necessarily be like, we have a prison abolition section just for you, and we're going to push this on you. So I went to St. Mark's Books, and I thought, you know, what is this thing that suddenly in my life, this gigantic jail, my friends are going to go to prison, you know, what is all this? So I went to the bookshelf Mark prison, and I just started reading. Also, thank goodness for independent bookstores because they would let a broke kid like me stand in the aisles and just read their books. Uh, you can't really do that with Amazon. Um, so, and I started reading so prison just, abolition yeah, materials. I apologize, Victoria. I just want to make sure we kind of get everybody oh. else in here. But um, no, I, 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 we're going to loop back to the okay we talked about, especially because we want to kind of make sure to mm -hmm. uh, talk to you more about your writing experience. Okay with prisoners in that but I just want to kind of get some other folks in okay there. yes sorry that was wonderful so Mia why don't you go ahead <laughs> okay hi hi everybody um so I think for me so I was so I was adopted from Korea when I was six months old I was raised in the Caribbean and I was lucky enough to be raised in a very strong tight feminist community Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough to be raised around, you know, Audre Lorde, Gloria Joseph, and to um, folks like, you know, Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich, Gloria Joseph, like they were part of forming 
the organization along with my mom was also part of that as well um, that helped victims of domestic violence and rape. And so I grew up around, it was founded the year I was adopted. And so I grew up around literally watching, um, watching women organize for themselves when no one else would. Um, Cause we, I grew up in a very rural Island that didn't have any services for domestic violence or sexual assault. And so they formed this organization and it was a direct service organization for sure. But at a young age, I remember, um, you know, I remember being told by my mother and lots of other women, like, you know, if you get pulled over by the, by the cops, like, especially if it's at night, just keep driving until you get to a place where there's a lot of people. And, Mm -hmm. and even my mother was like, I will pay your ticket. Like, don't worry. It is not, don't, don't stop for them. Um, if you're in a secluded area, like, at least get to a place where there's other people. So there will be witnesses or what have you. So I think because of their work, um, you know, uh, police officers and police departments have exceedingly high rates of domestic violence and, you know, sexual misconduct and sexual sexual assault is the second most common form of police brutality. And so I, you know, they were at war with the police um, department a lot of times and like helping um, their partners and girlfriends and wives all the time and families who are in crisis from domestic violence in particular and both and this was you know this was like 40 years ago 30 years ago where there was also work being done to like train the police officers as well so that you know they wouldn't so to try to reduce the amount of harm that was happening when the police would get called Mm -hmm. if (laughs) if anything happened at all and Mm -hmm. so I also grew up knowing that if I did get stopped by the cops, like half of them hated my, the work that my (laughs) mom was involved in and half of them were supportive of it. So I also just, I think I had from a young age, um, Mm -hmm. a deep understanding of oppression and violence. We had conversations about white supremacy at the dinner table, Mm -hmm. you know, just learning about um, the state at large. And then I think like the first time I was, um, in brought in formally to abolition as like the, like an actual formal uh, framework was when I found transformative justice in my mid twenties and was and this was before it became like big. I know now it's pretty trendy. This was like when we were begging people to come to trainings and like saying, hey, there's this thing that we should talk about. Don't you want to abolish the police and prisons? And people were like, no. <laughs> so. Um, But I remember like a lot of it came out of my work doing reproductive justice as well. Mm -hmm. And really set, I think that that helped to set the stage in a lot of ways because we were doing work around saying, look, you know, a lot of, we're not, we're creating a new framework, right? I mean, I wasn't part of creating it, but like we're, we're part of, I was doing reproductive justice at the time when reproductive justice was just making its way onto the main stage in a main way into the mainstream and saying, you know, we have to move away from just reproductive rights and we need to move towards reproductive justice because a lot of our communities, they don't, they need protection from the state, from Mm -hmm. the courts and the government, right? That they're not looking to those entities to protect them. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I came across transformative justice. And, you know, I think growing up the way that I did, I had a very strong understanding at you know, being five years old, six years old, understanding that intimate and sexual violence were happening everywhere. It wasn't just a couple of bad apples. It wasn't just a couple of like families that couldn't get it right. It was everybody. Mm -hmm. And I grew up spending my Saturdays, you know, playing with kids in the waiting room, which was just a hallway as like, you know, in the early days of the women's coalition as like families and um, particularly wives predominantly Mm -hmm. um, would go in to get counseling, to try to figure out like how, what they should do. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, and I, we are raising money for survived and punished. And that was very common, right? That, that women would get punished for Mm -hmm. fighting back against their abusers. And that was a very, very common thing as well. And something also that I feel like I grew up understanding. And the last thing I'll just say quickly is that I think also as an adoptee in particular, understanding how state sanctioned violence in particular can completely destroy lives and the connection between ownership and land, ownership of children and how that's deeply connected to ownership of land Mm -hmm. um, and how that has spurred so many things, but in particular, a billion dollar adoption industry. Um, And that St. Croix 
has a deep legacy of slavery as well. And St. Croix is the first, we're a US colony, um, we are territory. So we don't get the same rights as the mainland, but you know that we were the first place that Christopher Columbus landed in the new world, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And so I think also like all of that legacy and having, being from an island that is predominantly black, predominantly black Caribbean people um, and who have an understanding of colonization and understanding of, of the legacy of slavery all of that, I think, helped to set up myself um, in a place where even as a young person, I was already maybe not thinking about it in the, the words of prison abolition, but understanding the concepts. Thank you. Anoop, tell us about how you started thinking about you. So before this, I was asking you how long you had been a lawyer and you said you've been a lawyer for almost 15 years and that you had been interested in being a prison attorney um, originally. And so what was your interest like? Why did you want to be a prison attorney at one point? Yeah, so um, I grew up in New Orleans and at the time, um, Louisiana had the highest incarceration rate in the country in the US of course has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, but you know, prisons are really good at sort of hiding and disappearing people. So growing up, I was you know pretty sheltered and oblivious to all of this. I didn't know anyone in prison. Um, I started writing people in prison when I was a teenager. Um, and I was writing folks at Angola State Prison, which is this really infamous, uh, massive penitentiary in Louisiana that uh, was turned into a prison after the Civil War. It was a uh, plantation before that. Um, and so, you know, I was writing folks there and I really had no idea what to say to them the first time I wrote a letter. Um, I couldn't imagine there was anything that um, a really nerdy, awkward teenager could write to someone who's doing life at Angola um, that would be of interest, especially to someone who's like a, uh, a Black Panther. Um, but I'm really grateful that folks did write me back and have kept writing me back over the years. And I think that practice of writing incarcerated people has become a really key part of the way I approach abolition and the practice and the advocacy. Um, so I think you know, through years and years of letters and phone calls and visits, uh, with incarcerated people um, has been really helpful in shaping the way I think about incarceration, uh, shaping the way I view advocacy. Um, it's been helpful in unlearning a lot of what I would later learn in law school about what the role of a lawyer is. Um, and I think just there's constantly stuff I learn from incarcerated people, um, not about theory always, but just about you know the lived experience um, of incarceration and what it does. Um, mm -hmm. And so after going to law school, I started to focus more on uh, deportation defense and immigration detention. There's an enormous amount of immigration detention in uh, rural Louisiana. Um, and so my career is largely focused on representing immigrants and refugees, mostly Asian Pacific Islanders mm -hmm. who are facing deportation after serving time in prison. Um, and I think there's a lot of exciting intersections in doing that work, both with challenging uh, deportation and the criminal system at the same time but then also pulling in uh, a critique of US imperialism and all the factors that are forcing refugees uh, mm -hmm. and immigrants to uh, come to the US. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a really exciting um, um, work for a long time, but I think it always comes back for me uh, to those relationships with people inside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Surat. Great, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Tamara, for inviting me. Um, and thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to be in this really brilliant, amazing panel. Um, so, yeah, I was, um, my name is Sarat. Um, I was born in the largest refugee camp um, in Thailand. My family were farmers from the countryside of Cambodia. And shortly after the Civil War broke out, um, which was a result of U.S. intervention and militarism in Southeast Asia in the 60s and 70s. Hundreds of thousands of us um, refugees fled Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, um, and eventually resettled here in the United States. Um, my family was first sort of placed in Indiana, um, and then my mom was like, I heard that, th I heard that um, there's a lot of Cambodians in Boston um, and that they've been getting a lot of support from the government. Let's try to go over there. Um, so my family eventually, like, secondarily resettled in Boston area, um, and I grew up there. I grew up in the, I grew up in the '90s in Boston in a time 
um, like and many of my fellow refugees, at a time where this, um, where the United States um, were building prisons at a high rate, were incarcerating folks, were targeting black folks, poor folks, um, and South Asian refugees, we were resettled um, into community, into these um, under resourced and over police communities, and got swept into the um, criminalization of uh, the young people in these communities. It's the 45th, this year marks the 45th anniversary of the end of the US occupation of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think for the past 45 years, we as Southeast Asian refugees have tried really hard to survive and to thrive in this country, knowing for fully well that um, the Vietnam War, or what we call the American War, um, was a was a memory that this country does not it was a was an event this country does not want to remember. Mm -hmm. So for me, my um, growing up poor, growing up refugee and queer in Boston in the '90s was kind of tough. Um, you know that our elders and our older siblings did not want to talk about what happened. They were kind of sort of shell shocked. Um, and um, but you know we we the, the ones who sort of like the younger teenagers, the younger kids. I I grew up. I saw police sort of dragging my friends out of the cars and beating them. Um, houses were set on fire um, by, um, you know, by, by white races who threw, who threw fire bombs in, in the middle of the night. Um, this, I saw the schools just sort of pushing us out, pushing all my siblings and all my peers out of schools. Um, and I just started, I, then I just started seeing friends and family and just going into being funneled into the prison system. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would disappear. And then later learned that they would put it, they would be put it, um, they would be taken care of by immigration. Um, so for me, I think um, when I started realizing, understanding what was how, what is going on, what is happening, why are we even here? And I, and I had mentors, a beautiful, amazing mentors who taught me, um, you know, some um, really important lessons that what was happening to us was not a fault, that we were part of a larger, actually caught up in a larger system of capitalism and militarism. Um, and it helped me understand um, and it helped me sort of figure out my politics about how do we then really get out my community free, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I, and, then, and, and then, so for me, I was like, okay, the only way we can break out of these cycles that we are constantly in is to be able to galvanize ourselves, to organize ourselves to fight back against state violence, right? Um, and then, the other thing is that, um, you know, growing up in the 90s, um, for me, I had, to, I had to grow up in close relationship with gangs and gang members. Southeast Asian gangs as teenagers in the 90s, for me as someone um, who's affiliated, um, I saw them as our original community defenders, as our protectors. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, like for us, Southeast Asian gangs formed to protect ourselves and our families from, from racism from school, from, um, from the racist school system, from the police. Um, and I've seen a lot of, gang mem a lot of gangs um, back then really support each other, get, get, um, raise money for funerals, um, walk kids to school who get picked on. And so um, they taught me early on really about what it meant to constantly be targeted, to be profiled, to be harassed by the police, to be in constant, to be in constant, um, to be constantly aware of the police around us. And, you know, growing up over there, I, I, the police were up and down our streets and on the blocks all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of grew up with that um, understanding of police and war and military being a constant part of my life. Um, and it was through organizing and finding a movement that really helped me understand that um, it's actually for us to, for my community to be able to break out of these cycles, mm -hmm. we have to mobilize and we have to fight like back against state violence and for a, a world without police and prisons. Thank you. So I appreciate everyone sharing um, some of your background and I know there's much more and uh, we'll get to hopefully some of that through some of the questions. And I wanna actually kind of loop back to Surat. So Surat and I met each other in the Bronx actually in New York almost 20 years ago. Um, and it was at CAV. And so part of what I wanna do in this conversation is that uh, for Asians who are thinking about abolitionist politics, um, I want to kind of encourage us to learn more about the
the ways that different Asian American organizations or Asian American activism has challenged state violence or has taken on police brutality or has done prisoner defense work. It's something that I don't think gets enough attention in kind of discourses about Asian American race politics or even in like scholarship on the Asian American movement. And, um, and so Sarat, when you were talking, I was thinking about like, so when I was in Philadelphia and this is, uh, when I was in Philadelphia and I met you in New York, I came to New York at CAV, and that's where we met was CAV organizing Asian communities. And one of the things is is that CAV um, had an office at th that time in the Bronx and in New York City. So part of the history of the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, which I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to talk about, comes from this anti-deportation organizing and comes from some of the convening that CAV did at the time. And one of the links about CAV that's connected to some of the points that some of you raised, right? This goes back to uh, Mia's point about kind of thinking about different levels of state violence, right? And this also goes back to Harsh's point, right? Like thinking about issues from colonialism to imperialism to the transnational adoption industry, right? Militarism, occupation. And, you know, one of the things is, is when we're talking about abolitionist politics today, it's like organizations like Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, um, critical resistance, right? But also like within Asian American politics, like CAV was one of those organizations that first started talking about like kind of hate crimes against Asians, but then they transitioned to talking about structural violence. So by the time I meet Surat at like in New York, CAV is doing work around welfare reform, right? And about the impact of welfare reform or about labor laws and how they make people's lives more precarious and about, you know, deportation defense, right? Um, and so this is something that I think like that's part of some of the genealogies is like how, you know, when you're talking about Surat, like people who organize to help you guys think about some of this stuff, right? Um, and so could you talk about Surat, like you, when I met you, you guys had just established PRISM, Providence Youth Student Movement, right? So you and Kohei Ishihara, right, were there. Um, Kohei is now somebody who runs Movement Farms, which is, you know, uh, an Asian owned farm place, employs a lot of people. It's meant to kind of, you know, help you, you know, feed the movement and stuff like that, right? But um, you guys had just started PRISM, and part of it was because the United States had just signed a repatriation agreement with Cambodia. So for those who don't know, if you, um, when you're deported, a country has to be willing to accept you, right? And so the United States had, you know, a country, whatever country is deporting you, has to agree to accept you, right? One thing I just want to say about Harsha's work is Harsha has done what I think is some of the most sophisticated research. And I'm saying this quite seriously, right? Um, I've read a lot about deportation work. I think Harsha has done some of the most sophisticated research looking at deportation politics in terms of what countries are expected to agree to to accept deportees, right, in throughout the world, right? So I, I cannot stress enough how sophisticated her analysis is about that. Um, but so when I meet you, Surat, you had already started PRISM, but also then the United States signs a repatriation agreement for Cambodians, right? What did that mean in terms of kind of the meaning of your work and this consciousness that you're developing politically? Absolutely, thank you. Um... Wow, 20 years ago. Wow, it's been a while, Tamara. Um, yeah, so, I, mean, so, you know I, mean? <laughs> I mean, in Providence, like in many other like Southeast Asian communities, the Providence Police Department was started in the 80s actually to survey Southeast Asian young people. The gang unit um, and the gang database was created because there was a, they saw there was a lot of gang activity in Southeast Asian communities, particularly young people. And so we were sort of like, we were, we were with an organization at the time, we were just a collective of friends and, and community members. And we came together and said, um, you know, like, what is it, what was it like growing up in Providence? And they said, we know the police, police by heart. They cut the road through our neighborhood. They take pictures. They put into this database. They pretend to be our friends. They just stop us whenever they want it. We were like, that's kind of messed up. And so we were actually, PRISM started, um, started, getting some research done and started work, um, trying, to, trying to work to dismantle the gang database, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, with gang enhancement laws and stuff, it was like a fast and easy way for young people to get really put into the, the criminal system. Um, 
But then, um, but then we heard about this amazing, this, this rally that was happening in Massachusetts about an hour away in Lowell, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. We were like, what's it about? Um, and it was, it was the early summer of 2001. And it was, it was a rally about, it was a rally that was re- led by gay members, former gay members of families, no organizations, no nonprofits. In the, in, the, in the biggest community park in Lowell, in the second biggest Cambodian population in the country. And they, their message was clear. Deportations is happening, um, community members, and we have to prepare ourselves. And so we went there, we heard that message, and then we brought it back. We were like, we have to respond to this. This is directly connected to our work around gang database. Um, this is connected to our work against the, uh, the gang unit. We have to connect this work, right? Because for Southeast Asians, it was like you go, you, you, you're a refugee kid, you go into the schools, you get harassed, you get pushed out, you, you, you join the streets, join the gangs, and then your first, then your entry was with the police, right, into the criminal justice system, and then into, into um, the immigration system, into detention. And then at that time, folks were released, right, because there was no repatriation agreement. Mm-hmm. Come 2000, 2001, a repatriation agreement was signed um, shortly after 9 11. Um, which then created this crisis of deportation. And so then for us, we were like, okay, we got to fight this on the local level. Um, and then we heard a call out from, um, from the Southeast Asian Cambodian and Vietnamese leadership in the Bronx, um, who, who are a program of CAV. They said, let's come together to address this crisis, right? Um, and you heard that call out to Tamara and you joined us. Um, and on that really hot, hot weekend in the, in the Bronx, yes, we came remember. together <laughs> and said, enough is enough, right? Yeah. Because this is the US, we were sort of, we were bombed, um, the US came in there, destabilized our countries, we were bombed, we were then forced to become refugees, um, survive a genocide, go into the camps, get resettled into the US, right? They had to resettle again, um, and then had to go to the school system, being over-policed, and then now funneled into this immigration system and now deported back, mm-hmm. right? Or deported to Cambodia, enough. Enough was enough. And so, but we also knew that we had to form, we had to do, we had to fight it locally and we had to fight on a national level. Mm -hmm. Um, And so let's, we said, let's form a network of organizations, of communities, of families, of gangs across the country. Let's call ourselves the Southeast Asian Freedom Network. And let's think about how we can build a movement to do deportation defense locally and nationally for our people. yeah, I mean, 20 years later, you know, um, almost 20 years later, we're still fighting the good fight. Um, we're still trying our best, our hardest. We have not been able to stop deportation, but we've been able to keep a lot of families together um, mm-hmm. and reunite quite a few families. Um, and I, and I, I say this also, I think the beauty of CFEN at that time and up until now was that it was a call out led by Cambodian women and queer folks. And this is really important, right? Because it was the Cambodian women and queer folks who, who did that call out, who brought us all together, formed this vision to defend um, our communities and our, um, and our community members who were mostly men, right? Mostly cis men with deportation orders. Um, and, you know, we, we also knew early on and, we could, and we're still relearning trying to figure out how to do this. We have to do this, this um, anti-deportation, anti-deportation work, this deportation defense work, um, we have to do it with, through a queer and gender justice analysis mm-hmm. lens, right? Um, that as we do this work, we know that um, queer folks and women folks um, also um, are directly affected by deportation in many different ways, right? Um, and are also the ones who have, who, who have rose up and have did the defense work the most in that community. So, um, so for us, um, you know, um, as we're doing this after 20 years later, we're still trying to figure out what it means, um, trying to figure out a definition of what South Asian abolitionist feminism means and trying to take the lessons learned from the past 22 decades of organizing and try to put forward something that I think would be really powerful for all of us. Thank you, Sarah, that's wonderful. And, and I think this is a good segue to kind of talk about some points that I wanna bring Mia and uh, Victoria and Anoop in is that you know, Victoria, one of the, uh, as uh, we had, I had shared with you, it's like, and this goes back to kind of some of your stuff uh, you were talking about with the bookstores and the lefty bookstores mm-hmm. that you get, is that some of the earliest writings of yours that I read 
was in these anarchist websites, right? And I told you that I didn't realize you were Asian at the time. I thought you were Asian. I thought it was like really fucking cool, right? <laughs> um, and that's when you would write under Vicky Law. And, and so, and, and some of your earliest writings, as you know, was about writing about women engaging in self-defense, right? Mm-hmm. And criminalized for it. And so, and one of the things, um, if we think about, uh, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw's very famous article, Mapping the Margins about intersectionality theory, that gets cited for kind of coining that term, um, is that that's about domestic violence. And it's about, you know, women of color being subjected to domestic violence. And as Mia was saying, you know, when you were growing up, Mia, like your family and your networks, they're all involved in this political work but domestic violence being talked about as kind of a public issue was not really the case. Like it's that type of work, Mia, that your your community was doing that was pushing it to be a public thing, right? Like one of the things Angela Davis said in an interview once too is like, you know, um, domestic violence has only in the, like the last 40 years or so been taken seriously, right? And obviously now we use the term more intimate partner violence to kind of recognize that everyone's not in kind of a domestic relationship within this heteronormative framework, right? But the thing is, so you guys have done some work thinking about um, gender and sexual violence as you know very real harms that people um, uh, experience and survive, and that people enact those harms. And so, how does you know thinking about uh, addressing those harms you know inform your understanding of kind of abolitionist politics? But also the way that you rallied around, um, you know, survivors, right, and and defending survivors, right, and defending themselves, right. So if we think about survived and punished, these are women who've been punished for defending themselves against different forms of gender domestic violence, and a significant number of women who are incarcerated are women who've experienced that violence or who have defended themselves against that violence, right. So I think, Sarat, the point you're raising about, you know, what does it mean that it was a lot of times women and queer people, right? Women and or queer people who are like taking on these tasks, but also having to think about then pushing a conversation about gender and sexual violence as part of the work of the community for kind of, you know, thinking through abolition, right? Or thinking through just even kind of getting somebody free from prison, right? Um, So Mio, could you share kind of, you know, how that informed, let's say, your trajectory in transformative justice work? Yeah, definitely. Um, So, yeah, my entry into abolition is through transformative justice work specifically. And the work of, I mean, TJ work is the work of how do we build, how do we build um, responses to violence that don't rely on the state that can actually, that are generative and not destructive, that aren't based in punishment and revenge and criminalization, what does that look like? And I think to me, it's such an important piece of abolition because one, I think that when people hear prison abolition, right, for example, or they hear the term abolition, they just think, get rid of something. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks a lot about how like abolition is not just the absence of something, it's the presence of values, of life-giving things, of all the things that we wanna build. I'm paraphrasing that. She says it much more (laughs) beautifully. Um, But, you know, I think that domestic and sexual violence, intimate and sexual violence, um, I I came came into TJ specifically around ending child sexual abuse. And as a survivor of child sexual abuse myself, um, like, and I under, so when I entered into TJ work, I came into it understanding that work around transformative justice, but work around specifically child sexual abuse was a strategic place and point and site to do prison abolition work because child sexual abuse so often, as well as domestic violence and sexual violence across the board, but especially child sexual abuse gets used as a wedge issue to argue for harsher and harsher sentences, more and more prisons, more and more cops. I mean, we're seeing that even now as we're as we're under the, you know, still under the umbrella of many folks calling to defund the police, for example, right? Like, well, what are we going to do about the child molesters or what have you? And that's always, it's always a wedge that gets used. But I think in transformative justice, though, one thing that I think is so important is that it's not just about abolishing the actual material prisons. Like part of what we're talking about is how do we abolish a culture 
of prisons, a culture of punishment, a culture of revenge, a culture of harm and trauma and criminalization that 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 gets normalized and not just normalized, but that gets readily encouraged as a good way to handle our problems. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the piece around intimate partner violence, sexual assault, rape, all of these forms of violence, like I think for transformative justice historically, that's where we've those are the forms of violence that we've historically been trying to intervene on. And that's where most of the TJ tools and practices that we've developed have happened. And now what I see is people trying to apply those same tools and tactics to state violence, for example. And a lot, and a lot of them don't work because they were created within a set, certain set of conditions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the connection that TJ brings is also, you know, like, this very popular phrase that people say, like, how do we also abolish the cop in our head? Mm -hmm. How do we also look, not just look at the harms that the state is doing, but also look at the very real harms that are happening inside of our communities? Because it's easy to hate a white police officer. It's easy to point at an ICE officer, right? Or to point at Border Patrol, of course. But when it comes to the people in our everyday lives, to the people who look like us, that we rely on, what are people supposed to do? And at the crux of that, primarily has been predominantly queer and trans people of color, women of color, children of color, families of color who have nowhere to go. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm even getting to the point in some ways where it's like, I don't even care what people's analysis about prison abolition is. It's still the fact that regardless of whatever you think, millions and millions of people are falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about undocumented communities across the board. Think about queer and trans people of color who who are they going to call? Children of color who are facing child abuse or child sexual abuse or witnessing domestic violence in their home. What are they going to do? And that's often the communities that I've been working with, disabled communities who aren't, can't even access social services because they're not even accessible, let alone state services, right? Um, and so to me, I feel like that entry point into abolition work was really <laughs> transformative, not to... <laughs> pun intended, I guess, it was really transformative, though, because I think that it it's always the missing link to me because, you know, it's 2020 right now. And I know everybody wishes 2020 never happened in some ways, <laughs> but also we are happy it happened in other ways. But it's 2020. Like, why can't the fact that we still can't respond well to some of the most common forms of violence that our peoples face across the board will continue to undermine our political work? Mm -hmm. Like, who cares? How many, you know, if the anti-gentrification campaign, if we won it, if two people were sexually assaulted in the process and they came forward about it and nothing was done, mm -hmm. right? And now you've destroyed the relationships that allowed for you to move that forward. Mm -hmm. And like, that is, I think, at the crux of when I think of my entry into prison abolition work, mm -hmm. that if that TJ, help, figuring out how to um, uh, respond to harm and abuse and violence in our communities in a generative way, in an effective way, ultimately helps us to be able to push back against state sanctioned violence. Mm -hmm. Because when we don't, it leaves us more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you know, one of the things I really appreciate about what you said, uh, Mia, is also when you said that you see these issues that go on in terms of specifically how um, uh, child sexual abuse gets kind of weaponized, right? But you see this as a site of potential struggle for making this really powerful abolitionist intervention. Because, you know, one of the things that's happening now that I think is interesting politically is that, um, you know, Catherine McKittrick, uh, who goes by Demonic Brown on Twitter, she said, you know, abolition isn't sexy, right? She, she said, you know, there's this kind of way that some people are kind of saying their work is abolitionist and it's not. And I think there's all this kind of pressure to kind of, you know, find an abolitionist space or to think that you're doing abolition work. And, and what I really appreciate about what you're saying is like, you're seeing these spaces where abolitionist politics need to kind of be pushed and experimented with and that you're seeing kind of, you know, it's, it can be wherever you're at and you can kind of focus on trying to push the boundaries of that, right? And, and really also understanding that like people will weaponize that and how do you kind of take your positionality to kind of push back against that? Well, exactly. And I think especially for Asian communities in particular, whether we're talking about Asian American, Asian Canadian, like whatever it is, Harsha, hi. hi. Um, but like, you know, like I think also we can reflect on the fact that for a lot of our communities, we already don't turn towards the state. 
-hmm. but we're, we don't do it in generative ways <laughs> necessarily, right? And so like, I also think that there's so many ways that, um, I mean, d oppressed communities across the board mm -hmm. really need to be under building up our skill set around TJ because because so many folks again are just I, either falling through the cracks or just going through without or just trying to like push their way through impossible situations, you mm -hmm. know. And when we get into things like you know domestic violence is happening between in a you know an undocumented marriage, right? For example, where the abuser is actively isolating. The survivor who maybe doesn't speak English as a first language, doesn't have any access to any kind of resources, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do we build communities strong enough to be able to respond to things like that? Yeah, and I think, you know, when we think to, and this goes back to kind of the Crenshaw article, like one of the things, and this is something that Insight Women of Color Against Violence has also emphasized, is that when people have tried to get support for domestic violence, that they sometimes then become the targets of the state in terms of, um, you know, increased control or captivity of them, right? And, you know, I'm thinking too about like part of the history of Asian American organizing the United States is this kind of development of social services because there are these large absences. So if we think about, you know, Manavi or Shakti, right? Some of these South Asian American shelters and like feminist organizations, these are groups that started in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s but it was partly because you had domestic violence in these Asian American communities. And these would not be considered abolitionist groups, right? But these were sites of struggle. And if we think about a lot of abolitionists, they come out of doing this feminist work regarding domestic violence and gender and sexual assault and seeing sometimes the limits of kind of dealing with the state um, and what, it, you know, what are other alternatives, right? And I think so that's some of it. Harsh, I see you nodding your head. Did you wanna chime in here? I was, <laughs> I was uh, vociferously agreeing, um, and particularly to the, the point around um, intimate partner violence and, um, you know, feminists who come to abolition specifically as a site of struggle and analysis and awareness around carceral feminism. So, I mean, for me, I've worked in women's centers and women's shelters and anti-violence uh, shelters and centers for 20 years. And for me, that has been one of my, in addition to immigration enforcement, one of my sites of politicization around abolition for the very reasons that we're talking about, right? We see the very real ways in which state violence actually underwrites intimate partner violence. Like they're not separate. The conditions of, uh, the conditions that create intimate partner violence are very much written by state violence, whether it's because you're undocumented whether you're poor, whether you're street involved, you know, whether you're black and brown, racialized, indigenous, et cetera, trans, sex working, drug using, whatever it might be. Um, and that those vulnerabilities are heightened um, as a result of state violence and very much seeing um, just every single day, women and trans folks being incarcerated, being arrested uh, for self-defense. And also um, I do wanna mention the involvement of child apprehension services, right? The very real threat of having your kids apprehended uh, when the state gets involved in such, or you know, there's just the fear of calling the police, particularly in the Canadian context for indigenous and black families, uh, for having the state involved um, in intimate partner violence, the threat of deportation, like all of that. So I was just agreeing because part of my trajectory around abolition feminism in opposition to carceral feminism has been 20 years of work um, in the anti-violence sector and very much seeing uh, you know, prisons and police as sexual violence, right? That these are state forms of sexual violence that are intended to enforce the gender binary, that are intended to enforce heteropatriarchy and just seeing that every day and how fucking devastating it is um, and how angering it is that there are still feminists who believe, um, you know, for reasons really that have to do with the nonprofit industrial complex, frankly, and holding on to funding Mm -hmm. um, who continue to uphold carceral feminism as a legitimate response to gender-based violence when everything we know, particularly stemming from lived experience, uh, is that, you know, the state continues, continues to enforce heteropatriarchy uh, when people are facing intimate partner violence. And I'm really sorry that I just swore there, by the way. Um, you know, it's okay, right? Like, I, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> as long as it's not at me, I'm totally cool with it for myself, but... So Victoria, I wanna go back to, you were talking about um, the significance of Black August in terms of thinking about Black women prisoners uh, resistance. 
And I was reading an interview about you and it said that you had, when you were at Brooklyn College, I believe, mm -hmm. took a, I'm always fascinated by people's kind of intellectual influences, right? So I'm, mm -hmm. sure I'm really intrigued by kind of who is the person who, you know, told you about George Jackson or how did you decide to pick up Soledad brother, right? Um, and Victoria, you took a, you did independent study with Dr. Jean Theo Harris. Right? I did. Who, for those who don't know, is a, a very, you know, established biographer of um, uh, Road the Parks, right? Um, but also, you know, she's part of a group of CUNY faculty who are right now trying to challenge just the total disregarding insult, insulting way that CUNY is being treated, right, by the state of New York. Um, so Jean Theo Harris, we applaud you for everything. But Victoria, you did an independent study with her. And can you tell mm -hmm. us about this independent study and how that shaped some of your interest in specifically women in prison, which I know has been a major kind of focus of some of your work. Yes. So I, when I was at Brooklyn College, I did an independent study with Jean Theo Harris, looking at um, incarcerated people's organizing and resistance from the 1980s to the present. So this was like in the early, mm -hmm. in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so what happens after COINTELPRO has decimated many of the liberation movements? What happens with the rise of mass incarceration and the war on drugs and Reagan and you know the war on crime and like all these things that swell prison populations and cut away all of these radical support movements that had sprung up in the 1970s? Um, so I did an independent study with her. At the end of the semester, I looked at everything I'd gathered. I had written to people in prison that were organizing, uh, all men with one exception. I talked to people who had been doing decades of prison organizing. I looked at uh, what had already been written. I looked at you know uh, prison newsletters and everything with maybe one exception was about men. Mm. So I thought like, what are women doing? And I asked. I always said, you know, what are the women doing? And people kept telling me women aren't organizing, women aren't networking. Mm -hmm. Now, having studied civil rights and black liberation movements under Jean Theo Harris, I knew damn well that women were organizing. And so just because you were in prison and there were 99,000 women in prison at that time, they weren't all sitting on their hands and being like, oh, this is so sad that we're in this terrible condition. So I thought, well, what are the ways in which this is happening? And so I will try to be very brief with this little bit of uh, backstory. But so at the end of this, I brought this up to Jean Theo Harris as I'm turning in my work. And she looked at me and she said, well, that means you're signing up for an independent project next semester. And you're going to be looking at what women are doing. Now, at this point, I am very pregnant. I'm about to drop a baby. Uh, my, my goal is to like do the stupid science courses that are required of me and the stupid math course and get the hell out. <laughs> I'm not trying to like add more to my workload. You know, I'm like, I am having a baby in about three weeks. I'm not doing oh, this. Wait a minute, three weeks? Lord, you know, okay. Like, you know, like, like, you know, like, so you're basically asking me to come back when my kid is six weeks old and like do this independent study that it doesn't, I don't actually need to graduate. Like all I want is that stupid piece of paper that will allow me to get a better paying job at this point. And she said, no, you're going to do this independent study. She said, you can... We can meet off campus at your convenience. You can bring your baby. I will hold your baby. You know, we can like meet, we don't have to keep a regular schedule. And the only thing that you cannot slack on is the scholarship. And I wanna, I always bring this up because I want people to understand that there are different ways you can support folks in coming to intellectual development and political development. And sometimes it is as simple as saying, you don't need to take a one and a half hour train ride every week to campus to meet with me. You know, we can meet at a, a better point, you know, like we can meet at the local library. You can strap your baby to you and bring your baby. I will hold your baby while you explain to me what is happening. You know, I, you can, you know, like we will figure out ways that we can work around the fact that you are a brand new parent. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you are not allowed to do is keep coming up with a uh, good kid, I can't do this. Um, so I expect the same amount of scholarship and the same quality of work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are going to like work around the fact that suddenly you are going to have no sleep and a squalling infant mm -hmm. with you all the time. And so I started looking at what everything I had seen about uh, incarceration and I threw that out the window and I started looking at what women in prison mm -hmm. were looking at. And at the time people weren't talking about 
trans folks and gender non-binary, gender non-conforming and non-binary folks in prison. Like, you know, like very much the conversations in the 90s were like this one or that one. Mm -hmm. So I looked at what I saw about this category, which not very many people were looking at anyway, and saw that a lot of the issues that they were seeing were very different mm -hmm. uh, than they had all of the same issues, bad health care, violence, uh, racism, you know, abuses that people in men's prisons were having. But then there was also this other set of factors that weren't necessarily being discussed in prison literature about men. So we weren't seeing things like, you know, domestic violence, family violence, histories of abuse and trauma. Um, and we weren't seeing things like in literature about men's incarceration, about their connections to their children, even though the majority of people in men's prisons at the time were parents to children, like because of the way we gender parenting, uh, they didn't have to worry so much about where their kids were. You know, they might not be in the most ideal situation, but they were less likely to end up in foster care. So basically everything that I saw pointed me towards a more gendered analysis of what was happening inside prisons, mm -hmm. which then led me to this, you know, down that rabbit hole of domestic violence and family violence being one of the pathways to prison mm -hmm. for so many incarcerated women. I think most of the, depending on the study that you look at, somewhere between 75 up to like 90 something percent of people in women's prisons have past histories of trauma and abuse from people that said that they love them. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an astounding number. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was what, you know, sort of like drew me into this work and also seeing these connections between uh, interpersonal violence and how that leads people or pushes people. It doesn't lead people. Like it just violently shoves them into, you know, into the, you know, like the, the, maws of the state, you know, and subjects them to more state violence. And then the ways in which prison just reinforces all of that trauma and violence. And I forget what your original question was. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, this was wonderful. Thank you. So Anu, why don't you share with us, since you uh, work with Survive and Punish, and that again is one of the organizations, that is the organization that we um, accepted donations for for this talk. Um, can you tell us about Survived and Punished and how it kind of connects? And, and they're an explicitly abolitionist organization. And so um, can you talk more about them, please? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so Survived and Punished is an um, abolitionist national organizing project um, focused on the incarceration of gender violence survivors. Um, and Survived and Punished came together a few years ago, and it was... Um, folks had been running a bunch of different individual defense campaigns. Um, and so um, folks had been advocating in California uh, for Nan Hee Jo, a Korean domestic violence survivor who was uh, facing prosecution and also deportation um, for leaving an abusive relationship with her uh, child. Um, and then other folks in California were fighting to free Kelly Savage, uh, a domestic violence survivor who was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Uh, there was a campaign going on in Florida for Marissa Alexander, uh, who was uh, convicted for firing a warning shot um, and self-defense against her uh, abusive ex. Um, and so all these different folks around the country were running these different um, defense campaigns. And there was a long lineage of uh, defense campaigns for survivors going back to Joan Little and even further back. Um, and so um, these different organizers decided instead of running individual defense campaigns, we needed to create sort of a national network um, to respond to this issue. And so Stride and Punish came together a few years ago. Um, and for me personally, um, really so much a lot of other folks were saying is, you know, I think everyone has experience when you go inside women's prisons and every single person you meet, you know, experienced um, sexual assault, childhood sexual abuse, uh, domestic violence prior to getting to prison. And it's again and again and again. And then you see, you know, cops doing their um, you know, wearing their domestic violence ribbons and claiming that DAs and prisons are there to uh, protect survivors, then it's really hard to reconcile. Um, so I ended up joining Survive and Punish around 2016. And one of the first campaigns that, or individual defense campaigns I did with Survive and Punished uh, was a campaign for Nia Norn. Um, and this campaign I think was really critical in tying together the Cambodian anti-deportation work with the gender violence work. Um, and so if you want to read more about Nia, Vicky actually did a wonderful write-up of um, Nia a few years ago when she was still in immigration detention. I know spent 
many, many, many hours on the phone with Nia. Uh, but Nia is a uh, Cambodian refugee, came here as a child, um, entered into an abusive relationship uh, when she was still a child uh, with a much older man. He ended up um, killing someone out of jealousy. And when she was 18, she ended up getting charged for aiding and abetting and was then to life without the possibility of parole, um, a death in prison sentence. And then on top of that, she had an ice hold, meaning that if she ever got out of prison, um, she'd be deported. Um, and at the time, no one in California history had ever left prison alive after being sentenced to life without. Um, and so Nia really likes telling the story. She first wrote me um, and, you know, I wrote her back, um, asked a few questions, and then ultimately, like, told her legally this is hopeless. Like, fighting deportation is just not going uh, to be possible. Um, and then Nia, of course, didn't take that for an answer and spent the next three years uh, writing me and calling me until um, I sort of agreed to uh, fight alongside of her. Um, and so Nia became one of the first people in the history of California sentenced to life without uh, the possibility of parole to leave prison. Um, and so she left prison in early 2017 and was handed over to ICE. Uh, we launched a very long and intense defense campaign for Nia um, that Vicky uh, was a huge help with as well um, and ended up winning Nia's release in um, November of 2017. Uh, she got out of prison, joined Asian Law Caucus, where I work, also as an organizer with California Coalition for Women Prisoners, um, Survive and Punished, um, Asian Prisoner Support Committee, um, and uh, really has just sort of been North Star of our Cambodian anti-deportation work, um, partially because um, there's this feeling that Nia um, always just pushes us to imagine and try things, uh, because if her freedom is possible as someone sends to LWOP, um, without, um, with an ice hold, then, you know, winning freedom for anything else is possible. So I feel like Nia is often pushing us to dream bigger, try harder, and she's um, constantly fighting um, for all the folks that she left behind in prison. Um, and one story which Nia uh, recently uh, shared was when she first got to prison, her bunkie in prison was an older black woman named Patricia Wright, who was also sentenced to LWOP. Um, and Nia got there and Patricia told her, um, it doesn't matter what the court said, you have to keep fighting. Um, and Patricia worked in the library and would always push people to go into the law library, research their cases. Um, and so um, Patricia um, is now um, terminally ill with cancer and uh, also has lost her eyesight. Um, and so a lot of folks, including Nia and many other formerly incarcerated people have been fighting for uh, Patricia to be released. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Patricia finally did leave prison uh, for the first time after decades of incarceration. Um, just before that, uh, Nia also got a full and unconditional pardon from the governor, um, stopping her deportation. Um, so it's been a pretty amazing um, few weeks, um, but really appreciate the way that Nia and other former incarcerated folks are always pushing us to dream bigger. Whew. okay. Sorry, that, that made me a little bit emotional, y'all. Okay, um, so I wanted to thank you so much for sharing that and just, you know, and the message that you are sharing from that work, right? And how you're inspired to kind of uh, dream bigger in terms of the political demands. Um, I wanna loop back to some things that people said just to kind of fill in some information. Uh, so as Victoria was saying, you know, when she was doing the independent study with uh, Dr. Theo Harris, just there wasn't a lot of scholarship out there. And so there's increasingly more scholarship about incarcerated women. So I just wanted to draw some attention to that. Um, for those who don't know, Adrian Rich, uh, going back to Mia's, you know, community uh, that she uh, was politicized in, Adrian Rich used to be a co-editor of Sinister Wisdom which was a multi culty you know, uh, a feminist kind of LGBT uh, focused journal. And they actually used to do uh, send, um, they were part of a tradition of publishing that would do send material to uh, the prisons, right? Victoria, I know you're involved in Books Through Bars, right? I think you're a founder. Were you one of the co-founders of in the- Co-founder. Co-founder. Uh, Books Through Bars, New York City, not the okay. one in Philly. Right. And so there's also this long history. And I think some of the things that you guys are also talking about is just like the communication with people in prison, right? That is actually part of some of the, you know, history, obviously, of political organizing. 
And so uh, Sinister Wisdom was a journal that Adrienne Rich co-edited uh, for a while with her partner, Michelle Cliff. And there's actually a special issue of Sinister Wisdom called Women Loving Women in Prison, right? And so they were doing some of that kind of groundbreaking feminist kind of uh, writing and publishing early on. Um, there's in 2018, Soul's Journal put out a special issue on black women um, and prison resistance and resistance to carcerality. Um, Dr. Kali Gross, who's written a lot about black women criminalization, um, her one book, Colored Amazons, is kind of a classic in that work. Um, she was one of the main people uh, of that project. So that's something for people who are interested in that work. Um, but also, I was just thinking about, you know, when you're talking about kind of uh, prisoner defense work and what you're saying, Anoop, about survived and punished coming out of these different groups like Love and Protect, um, you know, the Michelle Alexander Defense Committee. Miriam Kaba has written about, and many of us know Miriam Kaba uh, in terms of her Twitter handle, Prison Culture, and she's been very influential in kind of getting more people to think about abolitionist politics. Um, but, you know, Miriam Kaba has talked about the significance of prisoner defense committees. And so that's actually part of some of the tradition of Asian American organizing that doesn't actually get some of the attention. So I wanted to just, before we move on in the conversation, bring up a couple of cases that um, I would like to see more Asians kind of, you know, dig into because it is part of our activist history. So there was, um, uh, first of all, this goes back to Surratt's point, right? So Asian Americans United, you know, when you were talking about Surratt, like some of the racial violence and, you know, of white people just, you know, uh, targeting Southeast Asians, right? And, and this was actually a lot of the kind of culture of racism in the 90s and 2000s. So if you think about the dot busters in New Jersey, these were white people who specifically targeted South Asian Americans in New Jersey, right? If we're thinking about, you know, um, neighborhood violence and whites targeting Southeast Asians. So in the 1980s, Asian Americans United in Philadelphia, which was the community organization I used to work for, and um, they did a major campaign around this McCree incident. And this was a group of Southeast Asians who had defended themselves against white racial violence. And they were up on criminal charges and so forth. And so Scott Kershagu, the historian, who's kind of a friend of Asian Americans United, he's written articles about that, but that's something that's kind of a fairly recent kind of part of Asian American political history of kind of creating a defense campaign among, you know, what would be unpopular uh, victims, right, or unpopular targets of the police, right, Southeast Asians who physically, you know, were accused of defending themselves uh, against white racism in the neighborhoods, right, and this was when Southeast Asians were just kind of becoming more understood, right, um, as a racial or ethnic group. Um, uh, because one of the things is, is that, as you know, Southeast Asians, unlike other Asian ethnic groups, Southeast Asians really are a fairly new group, most coming after, you know, uh, the Vietnam War and the genocide and so forth in Cambodia and Laos. Um, but also there is the, cho um, the uh, <clears throat> there was the work around Chol Su Lee, and this was a Korean man who uh, in the 70s uh, defended himself killed another person, then he went to prison, he got in some uh, stuff in prison. And that was a national campaign around him. And it was a lot of Korean immigrants who uh, defended him in this defense committee. Um, uh, Bill and Yuri Kochiyama were part of this defense committee, right? So we know a lot of times Yuri Kochiyama gets a lot of attention for her work with Malcolm X and for her support of political prisoners, right? Um, the title of her book by Dan Fugino, uh, uh, Heartbeat of Struggle, is in reference to political prisoners. But Yuri Kochiyama used to talk about political prisoners versus social prisoners. Social prisoners being people who are kind of targeted by the police just because of social conditions. And Bill and Yuri Kochiyama, as well as uh, Tak and Kazuo Jima, were very active in the Chol Su Lee campaign. And Kazuo Jima was a communist Asian American uh, before she went into the internment camps. She eventually denounced the Communist Party because she felt that the Communist Party did not defend Japanese people enough from being interned. But she raised hell in the internment camps and she was one of the co-founders of AAA, Asian Americans for Action, one of the first kind of leftist Asian American groups in the East Coast, right, it was intergenerational. Um, but then also Bill and Yuri Kochiyama were part of the David Wong Support Committee, 
So David Wong was an Asian American person who uh, had gotten in trouble for armed robbery. He goes to prison. He is somebody who um, got uh, set up in prison and it became this whole case unravels where it becomes proven. It was actually a Desi, a South Asian who took on his case. An entire support committee gets developed around him. Your coach on was central in creating that support committee. Um, and Wayne Lum, who was an Asian American postal worker was one of the major strategists of that committee, right? And thinking about like a new, you talking about writing letters, but also Victoria, I know a lot of your work is keeping in touch with people that you've interviewed for your stories and you do a lot of letter writing with prisoners and maintain communication with them. You know, that was actually part of kind of the work that this defense committee did was just maintaining a lot of communication, writing a lot of letters, right? And sending kind of holiday meals and gifts to David Wong and so forth. Um, David Wong eventually got deported to Hong Kong, but that's part of kind of the history of Asian Americans engaging in uh, defense committee work and prisoner support work around kind of unpopular cases, right? That I, I, I would like to see more Asian Americans talk about. Um, the Chosul Lee case, there was actually an Amerasia special issue dedicated to a lot of people who were involved in that case, working on that. Um, and you can look that up as well as the David Wong stuff. So. Now, Harsha, I want to go back to something you said about, you're talking about what happened, um, you know, some of the stuff around after 9-11. And as you know, Surat, uh, it was shortly after 9-11 that they, you know, signed the repatriation agreement. And, you know, we have to think about Cambodian deportation, right? And so, Harsha, you know, being in Canada, what impact did, you um, 9-11 and immigration enforcement and the and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which we know is just one iteration of border control, right? But what impact did that have on some of the political organizing you guys had to do regarding kind of thinking about state violence and specifically as you've talked about border imperialism, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in the post 9-11 climate, one of the things that actually happened in Canada was very similar to the formation of the DHS in the United States. We ended up with the, the Canada Border Services Agency, uh, which really mirrored the creation of DHS, right, in terms of a massive immigration enforcement with tasked explicitly with um, kind of uh, seeing immigration enforcement as a national security threat, right? So immigration increasingly, it always has been, of course, around surveilling, um, and particularly the ways in which imperialism connects with immigration enforcement. So we see, uh, similar to the United States and Canada, that historically there's been a welcoming of certain kinds of immigrants and refugees. So either those that are white middle class um, or those who represent, uh, you know, those who have fled um, communist regimes, right? So that kind of selective, uh, that selection process. But after 9-11, very similar in terms of the explicit linking of national security to immigration enforcement. Um, one of the things, and this kind of speaks to the transnational alliances and specifically around Asian organizing, uh, one of the things that we saw after 9-11 was an escalation of, of deportation, similar to the United States and similar to the roundups that were happening right after 9-11. So the mass registration and the mass roundups of people from predominantly Muslim majority countries was also happening in Canada. And so one of the organizations uh, that we were deeply connected to, I lived on the East Coast then, uh, was DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving in New York. Um, and so those were our comrades over the past 20 years that you know we trained together. Um, and also that really helped us think through immigration enforcement. And DRUM, as people may know, has always done deep work in linking immigration enforcement to uh, the prison industrial complex, to prisons, to police, you know, the school to prison pipeline, all of those interconnections. Um, and so we were very much seeing that. We were seeing deportations escalate in general. And then we were also seeing the rise in um, what in the US uh, we talk about as criminal deportations, right? So increasingly harsh, punitive deportations of people uh, who were incarcerated or formerly incarcerated or with arrest records. Um, so a lot of work um, that I started doing around immigration enforcement. So this was, you know, all volunteer grassroots community collectives uh, was really working with people facing deportation who really no major service provider or legal organization would work with. And so we were doing work in our communities uh, with folks, a lot of youth, um, who were, you know, gang involved, gang affiliated, had um, 
uh, histories of um, criminal incarceration and criminalization. Also a lot of people who were on Canada's terrorist list um, and I'm sick and in the Canadian context, one of the, one of the largest kind of proportion of organizations or um, that are on Canada's terrorist lists are sick organizations. And that really stems from, you know, the, the specific history on the West Coast of the Gother Party. So the Gother Party was a revolutionary anti-colonial South Asian formation um, that actually called for independence from the, for the British Raj mm. in the West Coast of Canada for the South Asian subcontinent before South Asians on the subcontinent did. So they were a transnational revolutionary formation. Um, and one of the first kinds of um, martyrs in, in South Asian history um, that's transnational is someone called Mewa Singh. And Mewa Singh lived in Vancouver and he assassinated an immigration enforcement officer in the early 1900s. And so the specific criminalization of sick people on the west coast of Canada really dates back a hundred years. And then of course we had Air India um, and the genocide of six. Um, and so I say this all because there's a very specific history of sick criminalization um, in the Canadian context. And so we saw an increasing deportation um, of six in the post 9-11 climate, um, you know, which is distinct but similar to the kind of um, you know mistaken identity and hate crimes targeting six in the post 9-11 climate in the US but very non-mistaken um, in that sense and um, so that's some of what we saw in the post 9-11 climate and one of um, one of the most kind of profound moments of organizing for me there's many uh, but was uh, in the mid 2000s and this was a defense campaign for Lembar Singh and Lambar Singh was a Dalit refugee. So Dalit being, uh, you know, folks who are non-caste um, in, the, in the kind of caste system uh, in the South Asian context. He was also paralyzed from the waist down and he became paralyzed as a result of a workplace injury in Canada. Um, and so, you know, he was being deported and by kind of all measures, he was seen as a, an undesirable refugee, right? So someone who was Dalit, the kind of ableist narratives of him no longer being productive for the Canadian economy. I um, mean, he was facing deportation. And, you know, again, this was someone who even in the South Asian community in the beginning, there was very little support for, for because folks were like, you know, this person's gonna give us a, a bad name, a bad image, we want good immigrants, et cetera. Um, but it really was a lot of aunties to Sarat's point. Um, a lot of aunties um, who mobilized to defend Lembar Singh. He was taken into sanctuary in a Gurdwara. So, you know, this, a space of worship um, and a non-Christian one that was heavily surveillance took him in. Uh, he was there for uh, almost two years. Every time immigration enforcement came to try to remove him at like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., we'd have blockades defending the Gurdwara with hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, truck drivers who would pop open the fronts of their trucks to form a truck blockade, mm. you know, aunties in their 60s and 70s, elders who would just blockade and circle him with like, you know, with love and defense. Um, and then, you know, when he was slated for deportation, and this predates the kind of docu-deportation buses, um, those blockades, uh, there was one of the largest mobilizations that has ever happened in Canada in terms of a direct action where 3,000 people showed up at the airport to prevent his deportation um, and just encircled him, you know, with love and thousands and thousands of people. And again, you know, mostly elders. I um, mean, it was phenomenal, the organizing on the Punjabi radio stations, you know, cab drivers saying, sorry, we're not driving cabs today. We're all going to the airport. They formed a taxi driver blockade, you know, which is very similar um, and really, uh, you know, similar to the work of the New York Workers Taxi Alliance and the, the taxi blockade that they had you know, years later, um, both for labor rights and really against Trump's Muslim ban. And so this was years and years of organizing um, and really mobilizing in our communities against repression, against criminalization, against immigration enforcement, and also doing the work internally within our communities about what it means to defend people who even within our communities are considered so-called undesirables, right? To speak back and in support of Dalit folks, to speak back, against casteism and caste oppression to speak back against you know ableism and the idea that simply because this person is no longer a so-called productive worker 
in the capitalist economy that their life is somehow not worthy. Um, and so really this iterative process of expanding what we mean by no one is illegal, that it really is a form of transformative justice, right? When we say no one is legal, it means that we're willing to defend every single human being um, and to ensure that they're outside the clutches of state violence. And so, you know, that's just, that's just some of the things, but really that was um, mobilizing within the Asian community specifically. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up DRUM. So DRUM, for those who are unfamiliar, is Daisy's Rising Up and Moving. And um, Daisy is a term for people who identify with the South Asian diaspora. It's kind of a politicized term. Um, and they formed in early 2000. And one of the things about DRUM is that they specifically focus their work on working class and poor South Asian Americans. And so part of the history, I think, of Asian Americans challenging um, the police state is also about a lot of times claiming working class and poor communities, right? So if we think not only in terms of like drum different groups, but it's also like, um, if we think about the history of like labor activism, right? Garment Workers Center, Thai CDC, Asian Immigrant Workers Advocates, Koreatown Immigrant Workers Advocates, right? You know, part of it is the threat of always being, you know, uh, of deportation being called in on immigrant workers if they, you know, uh, become too militant at the job or if they stand up for themselves or organize for themselves, right? There's always that threat of kind of having the state called in and using immigration enforcement. And so one of the things I think was really powerful was you saw a lot of Asian American groups, not all of them, there was a lot of internal kind of political tensions, but some that explicitly said, we're going to work around working class and poor immigrants and challenge some of the class and elitism within our own communities, right? And this also meant dealing with people who are sometimes gonna be more likely to be targeted um, by the police, right? So I wanna end on a question about how does your understanding of yourself as in terms of your racial identity and in terms of histories of colonialism or histories of um, you know, refugee genocide, right? Like, and survivors of genocide, right? Like, how does that shape your, your understanding of abolition? Uh, Sarah, I watched uh, CFAM's uh, talk you had, I think in July, right? About supporting Black Lives Matter and about uh, the investment that Cambodians should have. And it featured a lot of different Cambodian American organizers. And there was this really powerful point where um, Chaya Chom, and Chaya was somebody who used to be one of the youth organizers at CAV. And that's, I met her when I met Sarat. And then she eventually becomes one of the youth directors of their youth leadership program there. She now is the co-founder and director of Mekong, which is in the Bronx and which serves a lot of uh, Cambodian Americans, right? And she's part of the network of Southeast Asian Freedom Network, right? And Chai said something really powerful where she said, you know, as genocide survivors, they know genocide. And that this means that um, they have a responsibility as genocide survivors for supporting black people's challenge against genocide here in the United States, right? And and I know you co-signed on that. Can you talk more about that, Sarah? Because I I was so sure. moved. Yeah, Chaya Chong is uh, my idol. Badass. Can we just say um, the badass, right? Like such a, such a badass, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I think um, for me, as growing up as a Khmer refugee, um, developing my own sense of abolitionist politics, um, the Cambodian American experience, the Southeast Asian experience with me, has to talk about violence, right? It has to talk about state violence. So. You know, from from even the most lefty to even the most right conservative, like Cameroon American organization, there's always there's always that analysis of the genocide that we survived, right? Of of living through totalitarianism, fascism, surviving genocide together, and then resettling here in the U.S. Um, and so for me, the you know the we we, we spent the past forty five years we've been here. Um, and 20 years at CFAN to really develop a political identity about what it means to be Southeast Asian American, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, that analysis has to be connected to the reasons why we are, why we became refugees and we settled here in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And the analysis is connected to, to the U.S. imperialism, to um, the wars in Southeast Asia, to the American war, um, and even before that, to the colonization of uh, South Asia by the French, right? All this sort of like, um, all of this sort of like um, 
this analysis of like colonization, imperialism, of militarism, of war, um, and then a resettlement, which then turns into police, to then like homeless security and ICE and deportation. For us, it's all part of a bigger, 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 bigger system, right? And what we hold- Real quickly, can I ask you, sorry. How is that conversation, what is it like when you're trying to have that conversation in the communities when you're doing anti-deportation work and so forth? Like, like, because as you know, there's a whole kind of refugee resilience narrative. And you've yep. pushed back on that to kind of say, you know, is that resilience narrative being used to not kind of think through these political questions or the kind of political advance? So when you're thinking through all this stuff critically about genocide, like how do you approach those conversations in the actual organizing? And are people receptive to thinking about that as a linkage to thinking critically about the state violence here in the United States? Absolutely. Yes and no. You know, I think that, that we have... We have um, folks in the community, especially older folks who, whose memories are still so fresh and so raw, right? Um, who's seen the fall of the fall of the government, who's seen, um, you know, um, uh, fascism take over, who stared like who stared down police and soldiers with guns and said enough and that you cannot take my gun, right? Whose still memories and trauma are still fresh, and then you have younger folks who are growing up, who are who are growing up, who 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 are now watching this beautiful uprising, right? Who have witnessed sort of like, who are looking at some of the, what's happening in this country and are really trying to question and wrestle with the, what is, what is our position? What is their position in Southeast Asian in this country? So the conversations go so, are so varied, right? Um, and so multi-layered. What we do know is that we try to approach our communities and our families and our, um, and our folks where they're at, to understand the trauma that folks have had uh, as a result of the war, the trauma that folks have had as a result of trying to resettle here in the United States. Um, and that for us right now, that our, that what we can do is actually acknowledge all that and then help move our folks to acknowledge it, to understand it, the larger system, and then move our folks right now into the openings, the beautiful openings, opportunities that the Move for Black Lives is offering, the U, uh, offer, offering us in the US, right? to reimagine a world, right? Where Southeast Asians have finally don't have to always try to survive, don't always have to fight back, that we can, that we can be, that we can be th survive, uh, that we can be thriving and, and be in solidarity with, with, him, with other folks who are facing genocide, who are facing state violence. And that's actually our responsibility to do that as survivors of the genocide. Um, and so oftentimes we don't even use the word abolition, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we just sort of talk about it in a way that sort of makes sense that appeals to, the, to our people's history and, and their trauma, right? And that's how we have to continue moving our folks forward. Mm -hmm. And the other piece, last piece, Tamara, is some, we can't bring, at, sometimes in this moment, right? Um, we, not everybody will be able to come along. That doesn't mean that we will leave you behind, but we gotta go. Like this, this, there's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot of opportunities and moments we gotta go right now. Um, and that, um, and we'll move there. Um, and when you're ready, come along with us. Um, and cause you know, cause we, we're in this together, but we got to move right now in this moment and then, and in this, and then this historic, um, uprising. So Mia, I wanted to ask you because you talked about kind of the various layers of your biography in relationship to colonialism, right? Both in terms of, uh, your adoption and also in terms of where you end up, right? Uh, in terms of living, right? Uh, in St. Kitts. And so how does that understanding of colonialism shape your kind of relationship to abolitionist politics? Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'm a Zoom cliche. Um, to me, I feel like, you know, a lot of it is to me goes beyond abolition even, but, but abolition to me is like the place I enter. And so to me, what it really has shaped my politics to be is, and, and I think transformative justice has done this in a lot of ways, is how do we build the world that we actually want? How do we not only push back against the world we don't want, which is super important work. Like we have to resist and both, and we have to build what we do Video 
Well, there's the event. I know it was brilliant, so because uh, everything kind of froze up, so I apologize about that. But we are going to actually kind of wrap up on that note. I know it was a little awkward or whatever, but um, does anybody on the panel have anything else that they want to say? Sorry, there was all this kind of weird this weirdness with Zoom, so it happens, you know. Um, but does anybody on the panel have any kind of last minute things they would like to say? Um, I can plug a campaign we have that folks want to take uh, action. Uh, we're running campaigns to stop transfers from California State Prisons to ICE. Uh, right now we have uh, campaigns active for two people, Tian Pham, who's a Vietnamese refugee at San Quentin right now in the middle of the COVID outbreak, and also Patricia Waller, who's from Belize. Um, uh, Nia Noren did uh, time with her, um, is also facing a transfer to ICE. If you want to take action, there's a toolkit. It's at bit.ly stop ice transfers. The S, ice, and the T are capital. Thank you. And for those, you know, some people might not be familiar with some of the stuff regarding uh, the relationship between immigration enforcement and the US criminal justice system. And that was stuff that we kind of alluded to here. I'm actually going to be giving a free online lecture August 20th, um, sponsored by the DC Socialist Night School. So that's something where I'll be talking more about kind of some of the history before DHS, as well as uh, some data sources and some specific policies for those who might want to get a better understanding of that. Um, and that's on my Twitter. So for those who are interested. So Mia, I'm so sorry you got cut off there. I was like, wait a minute, I'm all engrossed with it. It was like, so, um, but does anybody else have anything that they would like to add at the end of this? So. I mean, I can finish what I was going to say if nobody yeah, else has, but, but also please, if you all have things. No, 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 please go ahead. Thank you. My computer just restarted on its own. It was very, I don't know what happened. I was like, you know. this is exciting, but strange. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, what I was saying, <laughs> what I was saying that it is in terms of colonization and everything, I, I think that, I think that TJ has really shaped me to, to, to reorient my thinking and not just how do we push back against the world that we don't want, but how do we actually build what we do want? And what does it look like to not only say, cause I think most of us can talk forever about how fucked up things are. We can like analyze things left and right down to, into oblivion sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> to the point where it's not even useful. But, but when we ask people, what do you want then? You know, and, and the thing about TJ is, and this is true, like in reference to colonization as well, it's like, what do we want the land to look like? What do we want our relationships to be like? What do we want? What is justice? You know, I, I think transformative justice, one of the things that it offers us is questions of accountability are inevitably questions about justice and questions about justice are inevitably questions about accountability. And if we can't even figure out what accountability looks like between each other, like inside of our communities, inside of our families, of our intimate networks, how are we going to demand it from institutions, from states, et cetera? And I think TJ really gives us the opportunity to grapple with in real time on a micro level, what, is, what does justice look like? What is justice? I mean, for everybody on this call, 
and who's watching, you know, think about the times that you were wronged or the times that you wronged somebody else, even if it was not on purpose, Mm -hmm. what would justice have looked like? What would accountability actually look like? You know, that we want, yeah, we want to get our people out of the burning house for sure. Absolutely. But then where are we going to put them? Like, what, what are we, what are we actually building at the same time? And it has to happen simultaneously. It can't just be that we all divest and we just go and run, do the alternative work. That doesn't work. We have to do both because mm-hmm. there are real threats coming at us. So I would say that that's one of the ways that um, I've deeply been shaped, you know, growing up and on a land, I mean, all of most of us growing up on land, that's not ours growing up around. I mean, at least for me, I feel like growing up around people who, um, and learning how to be in solidarity with other communities in real time before we even knew what that language, what the, that term meant necessarily, but knowing it in our bones of like, how do we actually show up for each other because our liberation is bound up together. Thank you. This is actually, the point you raised goes to, so I think there's a couple of questions we can take. I, I just got them from Sean. Um, so one is this question about kind of building coalition across difference, right? both within the Asian community across race. And one of the questions they had was, is it possible to work towards abolishing prisons while working alongside reformists, right? Mm. I think this is an interesting question and not just for Asian Americans, just because as you see, you know, this is an interesting moment where a lot of people are kind of saying, they're kind of defining what is abolition. And there's definitely abolitionist principles about not um, using carceral responses to things and so forth. But there's also this way where this idea of kind of who do you work with or where would you do abolition or how can you build abolition, right? And so what do you guys think about kind of that question about can you build coalition in kind of reformist, uh, with reformists, right? Um, And how has that played out maybe some of the campaigns you guys have actually worked on? Because I think we've all worked with reformists, right? Like, I mean, it's part of getting sometimes work done, right? So um, Anoop, since you are, you work in in, with the criminal justice system in terms of like, you have to engage it, right? Obviously to kind of uh, defend people and so forth. Can you describe, discuss some of the ways that you try to kind of maintain an abolitionist politic while working and navigating in that system? Yeah, Um, and you know, I think Sarath, you were saying this earlier about not using the word abolition all that much when engaging with the community and you know, I, I'm not an evangelist for abolition. I don't feel like my job or role is to convert folks to abolition. It's helpful to me personally, but I think it's the practice of abolition and freeing people that I think matters more. And so, yeah, I mean, I end up working with a lot of folks who don't identify as abolitionists. And I don't think that's, you know, necessary um, to working with folks. Um, I think what is critical in the way we approach the work is who we center in the work. Um, and so I think there's something inherently abolitionist when you're centering folks who are lifers, folks who have murder convictions, um, gender violence survivors, I think there's naturally abolitionist thinking that comes out of those defense campaigns we run. Um, and you know, one other thing that strikes me is when I talk to folks in prison, most folks in prison don't um, identify as being abolitionists, right? Um, I mean, it's hard enough for us to imagine a society without prisons when you've been incarcerated for the last 15 or 20 years, imagining a world without any of this around you is next to impossible, right? But I feel like incarcerated people engage in abolition, even though if they don't identify as abolitionists, in daily practice, in the way that they care for each other, right? And the way that they show compassion to other incarcerated people, regardless of what they might have done. Um, I think those are like very deeply abolitionist practices, even if they don't use a language. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting the message that we have run over time, which we have, and so we're supposed to wrap this up. But I actually think, Anoop, that that was a really kind of lovely note to end on, right? About just, you know, thinking about abolitionist practices without having to necessarily kind of announce them that way, right? But um, so I want to thank everybody, again, who's involved in organizing this. I want to thank everybody who checked us out. And I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank you so much. I know we weren't able to get to everything, but I hope that um, we were able to amplify some of the work and some of your perspectives that you bring to this work. And I'm so, I have to tell you, I'm so deeply grateful that all of you guys responded to my DM when I was like, I want to have this conversation with you guys. So thank you so very much for this. Okay. Thank you for organizing. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. <laughs>